So, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar again. I am uh, Bam Bourdie, co-founder at uh, Zyku Group, and I will be your host. You can visit zykugroup.com to learn more about the company, but briefly, we are an R&D and consultancy consortium um, with a focus in emerging tech and uh, mathematics. Um, today's uh, webinar session is part of a wider series dedicated to distributed systems. Uh, the series will be split in two sections, essentially. One dedicated to the current adoption of uh, distributed systems in the industry, which this, uh, this today's session is uh, definitely 100% uh, uh, fit for that. And the other one dedicated to pure R&D, uh, where we look at the future paradigms of distributed uh, systems with academic researchers and uh, engineers and so on. Uh, going back to today's uh, session, I'm pleased to have Diego Pacheco, that's right, uh, the correct Portuguese pronunciation of his last name is Pacheco, not Pacheco, which is uh, Spanish. Um, anyway, very grateful for, to uh, Diego for taking his time to share his uh, insights into the universe of uh, microservices. Uh, drawing from his uh, vast experience working in industry, not just as a software architect and DevOps uh, practitioner, but also leading cross-functional uh, engineering teams across the world, including Brazil, the US, uh, Silicon Valley in particular, UK, Spain, and uh, India. Some of the software stacks that he has been working uh, with includes, uh, include Java, Scala, Rust, Go, Cassandra, Redis, and uh, Netflix, uh, OSS stack, so things like Simian Army, RX Java, and Eureka. Infrastructure-wise, he's primarily been working with the AWS and GCP. Um, please correct me later, uh, Diego. <laughs> it's all good now. <laughs> yeah. So that's my summary um, of uh, Diego. I'm sure he will be um, uh, sharing more with you. Uh, but for the time being, the webinar is structured as follows. So the main session will be with the with Diego, um, and then there will be Q and A's. On the Q and A's, please, um, if you have a question, go to the Q and A session uh, section and uh, ask it there instead of doing it on the chat. And also, please help Diego get uh, to select the questions by voting on the questions that uh, are most relevant to to you, so that it, it kind of uh, makes sure that uh, he um, kind of uh, satisfies. Uh, the wider audience as possible. And then we'll have a closer, uh, a close uh, remark at the end of the Q&A about what next and, uh, and so on. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and on Crowdcast, in particular on Crowdcast, if you are interested in emerging tech like uh, quantum computing, we will be giving, um, uh, we already had our first webinar uh, two weeks ago, we'll be having a few other webinars on quantum computing. So if you follow us on Crowdcast, you will get uh, notified whenever we have uh, an upcoming uh, talk, which we have one coming on Wednesday uh, related to an open source uh, quantum algorithm tool called Tequila. So yeah, uh, check out our Crowd Crowdcast page and uh, you know if you are interested, register for that as well. And also um, I invite you to visit uh, nanosite.com, which is our uh, uh, an R&D project that um, Zyku and uh, Yakov holdings we have together that works around uh, distributed systems. So without further ado, I will stop sharing and hand over to our guest, Diego, so he can uh, take over. So Diego, I think I will have stopped sharing. Um, the floor is yours, please. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for having me, Bombardier. Um, so today we're going to talk about a very unpopular opinion that I have, I'm calling it like the death of microservices or how you end up building a distributed monolith uh, one-on-one. So let's get started. So thanks uh, Bombardier for the introduction. I just wanna add that I am a cat father, so I have two cats. Hopefully they're not bashing their heads too hard against my door. Um, I wrote a build about building applications with Scala and I also record a series of videos how to build effective uh, microservices with the Java and Netflix OS stack. On the left here, you can get my GitHub and my Twitter handler. There's also my blog, which I blog uh, every week and my YouTube channel if you want more uh, content. So let's let's get started, right? So there's this companion uh, blog post. I blogged it a couple of uh, weeks ago 
Um, you can check it out. There's more on the subject and also more links and more lectures and more content if you are interested on. So uh, uh, just a disclaimer, okay? So you need to buckle up. This is a very unpopular opinion, right? And basically I wanna uh, challenge some of the current assumptions that we have uh, on the industry. So buckle up. So basically guys, um, the first problem with microservices is there is a reality mismatch, right? There, there's something is not correct. And, and I wanna provoke you with some questions like, are we doing really proper microservices? Um, and, and what I mean by proper is, do we have at least database level isolation, all right? And, and if you look to the industry, I'm sure that you know a case or you are working in a company that you have like a, you know, a shared group of tables that several applications access that same table, right? And then in the end of the day, you don't have isolation. If you don't have isolation, do you have microservice? So what, what was the difference from what you was doing before and you're doing now? And that leads us to the question is, are we doing microservice really like being microservice or are we just calling these things microservice, right? And I think the big question comes to play when we ask, can we upgrade libraries, right? So let's say there is a set of shared libraries, jars, right, in our microservice that we want to upgrade for a particular technology or framework. Can we upgrade that uh, in isolation, service by service, right? And often the answer is no, all right? And then, uh, you know, for me, all these things make me question if there's a future for microservice, if, you know, and that's a kind of a funny question because if nobody was doing proper microservice, how can you, you know, queue or something can be dead that never exists, right? It was just an illusion or something like that. So hopefully during this talk, we can understand these things in more depth. So, you know, when you adopt an architecture, you're basically trying to fix a problem, right? So I would say these are legit reasons why you would use microservices, right? Like, you know, you have difficulties to scale. In a monolith, it's much harder to scale you want to go with uh, specialized solutions. You know, you want to have like technology diversity. You might want to use Java for one problem, Scala for another, Rust for another problem. Um, you know, and microservices allow us to do that. And mainly I would say you want to have freedom to upgrade. And that property is not only a property of microservice, but I would say, um, you know, a proper architecture as well. Like the, the biggest thing for us is to have the ability to, you know, isolate things and upgrade things in isolation, right? And that's that's huge because the cost of change is often, you know, what kills several endeavors and, you know, end up putting us in a very bad path on, you know, the future. And also, um, you know, architecture and team organizations are really kind of the same thing. Um, you know, and microservices can help you to have a better team organizations to reduce the communication blast radius. So if you are doing microservices because you want to fix one of these problems or all of them, you definitely are on the right path. But often what happens is, you know, there's this social pressure or even envy, right, um, to build microservices because it's what everybody's doing, is what the cool kids are saying, right? So end up saying like, you know, I want to do microservices because it sounds easy, looks cool, um, but you know, in the end of the day, several companies do not know other options. And, and, and you know, to be fair, um, I really like Agile. I've been doing it for a long time, but if there's one issue in Agile, there's many. Um, architecture and architecture practices was not something that was really enforced or really uh, paid enough attention that was needed there, right? And, and, and I think that also contribute uh, for the problem. So. Let's talk about the, the benefits of microservices if you are doing it properly, if you're doing it correctly, all right? So you have the ability to deploy services independently. Um, you have the ability to scale services independently. You can have techno technological uh, diversity, which means different language, different frameworks, different data stores. You have the freedom to upgrade services in isolation and you end up with better team um, organizations. However, like anything in architecture, like anything in technology, there are trade-offs, there are drawbacks. So if you pick microservices architecture, you will have infrastructure complexity, period, because you will need to have separate pipelines for deploys for microservice. 
you would have different repositories in, in Git, for instance. You, you will have, you know, an effort that was much bigger compared with uh, your effort with a monolith, right? And in general, I would say you're going to have more complexity and, and not, not just because microservices, because, you know, distributed systems are great. It's how we can scale thousands of systems, but, you know, they are more complex. They will introduce failure and in, in, in a way that's not binary, right? There is all this um, grayscale failure. So, so it, it will be much harder. And also the last thing, which I think, you know, most of companies are still didn't get in it. If you want to go microservice, you need to accept duplication. And there's two kinds of duplication I want to point out. There is data duplication and there's code duplication. So data duplication, it manifests in the sense of, um, you know, secure as event sourcing, where you end up having, you know, copies of parts of data in your service that you have in other services as well. Um, and that's a data duplication. And also code duplication, which is the part that I don't think anyone get it. And that's why um, microservices are dying. And that's why we are building distributed monoliths. And I'm also going to get this subject in more depth on the next slides. I just want to point out that, you know, microservices are not the first thing that are, you know, going for duplications. If we look about, um, you know, the spectrum of distributed systems, pretty much NoSQL, if you look Cassandra, you know, in the way that you model your data to be effective is meaning you duplicate data, right? And, and that goes totally opposite on a relational system where, you know, you have normalization, you don't duplicate data. And, you know, NoSQL could just say, you know, being, being blunt, I could say NoSQL is about duplication, right? And so microservice, but let, let's continue on that. So on these trade-offs, we need to understand that, you know, isolation is great. Having isolation means a lot of good things. It means we reduce the cost of change. It means that for management, there is less coordination needed. You don't need to deploy all your, all your services at the same time. Um, you don't need to be fighting uh, for features at the same time and, you know, prioritizations in people's sprints and stuff like that. But there is a price. Isolation has a price, microservices has a price, and this price is duplication. But what happens is nobody wants to pay this price. And then we get in a situation where, you know, you cannot eat the cake and have the cake, right? You cannot have both things. And, and this leads to a distributed monolith, right? And this distributed monolith is primar primarily led by a denial of this drawback. So we just uh, ignore the fact that we need to duplicate. Or, you know, we try to do some kind of, uh, you know, um, we, we want to fool the devil and then we think we are smarter and we can still, you know, eat the cake and have the cake, have microservices and have um, shared resources and all be fine. And then in the end of the day, at the long term, you, you don't, right? And then you lose isolation. You lose one of the main benefits of microservices. So I want to talk more about code duplication. And, and I, I'm sure... First things you, you guys are thinking right now, okay, Diego is crazy because, you know, if you if you don't duplicate, if, if you want to, um, you know, duplicate code, this means you're going to have bugs and will be the same bugs in all services, all right? And also will be repetition, you, you know, will be error prone, will be really annoying. But I want to say, guys, there are other approaches besides duplication itself, and we're going to cover this later on. But, you know, if we need to pick between two devils, all right, two evils, we have duplication and we have coupling. I would get duplication without a blink, right? Without blinking. Because, you know, in the two things, definitely coupling is much, much more worse than duplication. So in, in the end of the day, right, if you pick to not duplicate code, you know, you won't be able to upgrade. So you, you can't upgrade your service, right? So I just wanted to say that's fine to duplicate code. It's not a problem. Um, so now let's go into the pitfalls or traps that will end up killing our microservice endeavor or, you know, how we build a distributed monolith 101. So there's a couple of things like monoripos, uh, shared libraries, uh, drivers, corporate frameworks, um, and tables. So let's, let's get there. So monoripo, right? So monoripos are being... Uh, very popular right now because of pretty much Google and Facebook. And th the question that I want to ask here is, is a monorepo a problem or a solution? 
because several folks think is a solution. And, and I think in some scenarios, definitely can be a solution. But I think in other scenarios, that definitely will be a problem. You will end up introducing a problem. You might not have it, right? And, and the question goes, is like, are we dealing with the same thing or not? Like, for instance, if you look Angular and you see is a framework as a role, um, you know, you want to have models. So you, you might have one module for routing, another module for internationalization. And then, you know, it would make sense to have all these modules in the same place because it's the same framework. However, if you think about a service that's completely different than another service, right? It's completely different concerns. Why would we need to keep these two things in the same place, right? Do we have isolation or not? Because if we have isolation, I would say we don't want to glue these two things together because there's a huge potential risk by having things close to each other, all right, that you end up coupling things. It will be much easier to do this coupling. And I think the following slides might explain that. And you know, in the end of the day, probably we're not Google, you don't have two billions of lines of code, so you don't have the same problems. So this is the biggest threat right now, right? They're called shared libraries. And these are a jar, um, you know, you could create for reuse. So shared libraries are popular because they existed before microservices. They existed before SOA. So it's basically how, you know, any language uh, can provide packaging and you can reuse code. I think that's the easiest form of reuse is shared libraries. Um, and I wanted to say, right, and that's an popular opinion, they are pure evil. Why? Because, you know, even if you create one jar, if you create one shared library, you're going to have third-party libs. So if you look at your class path, you're never introducing one jar. You're probably introducing 20, 30. Go, go look like Spring Boot dependencies. You're going to see right, what I'm saying. And as you do this, right, in the end of the day, um, you, you're going to have tens or thousands of exact libs you need to have for your services to work because you end up being coupled in Guava or being coupled with uh, IX Java or being coupled with Spring Boot. And then you cannot upgrade one service unless all other services are upgraded, all right? And then you have a different wooden monolith by that. I want to point out that, you know, services and product companies, they have different uh, mindsets and different ways to operate, but it doesn't matter if you are in a service or product company, this problem will happen. I will say that for product companies, it's even worse. Um, and, you know, th there is something worse than a distributed monolith, that there's nothing worse than a distributed monolith because a distributed monolith is the worst kind of monolith because it's a modern monolith and it's distri distributed, right? So we make uh, the evil that was in one box, right, the monolith, distributed. So we spread it everywhere, so it's much worse. So um, shared libraries are problematic, but there's something worse than shared libraries, which are drivers. So basically drivers are clients or network drivers, right? So, you know, people end up focus on optimizations, right? So you, you, you see this as, oh, let's use our X Java, or let's use, you know, there is this Flux Mono in Spring Boot. Right, and you want to do that because you you know it makes sense. You want to use less resources. You want to you know some code that's faster. However, the issue became um, you know now you cannot call the service unless you use the driver. So the only way to call the service is through the driver. And then in the way I see it, you you get a very bad deal because you are trading optimization for freedom. In, in your service should be easy to access to everyone, all right? You shouldn't need to, you know, have a very specific driver to access it because it will mean binary coupling. So, so it's a bad deal, right? Because as you trade optimization for freedom, you are killing your ability to change this code on the long run where, where the cost arrives and there where, you know, you lost your main benefit. But, you know, there's something even worse than drivers, which are corporate frameworks. So, in the way I see it, they are often expensive. They're really complex to use it. Um, they have lack of documentation or examples. They fail to have like level one and level two of abstractions. Like a good framework would provide you some abstraction that will be level one. But for some reason, the abstraction, it doesn't work. It will provide you a second level of abstraction. So let's say like in Spring, you have abstractions to deal with JDBC. But if that doesn't work, 
um, you can use the connection straight and do you know what you need. And often these corporate frameworks don't do not have things like that. And to be honest, people end up hating, and they hate for several reasons. They hate because they cannot search on Stack Overflow. They hate because they cannot tell their friends. They cannot use on other jobs or on their career. It's only for that company. So uh, people end up really hating corporate frameworks. And right now, um, you know, companies are not really into making corporate frameworks anymore. That was something more like 10 years ago. However, I would say that's not entirely true because there are still corporate frameworks uh, nowadays, but they appear in form of libs. Just because you have a jar, you're not calling a framework. You know, it doesn't mean it's not a framework. It is a framework because, you know, <clears throat> It can be spot in these ways, like it, it impose a very specific model, a very opinionated model of do things like, you know, let's say that could be some kind of a mapping like JPA or Hibernate. It could be like annotation driven. It could be um, like reactive, like, you know, like the whole Netflix OSS thing, you know, was about, you know, making hard for people to use servlets and to, to block code, right? And the whole idea was making them force them to go reactive and um that's a very opinionated and specific model imposing global is a problem if you want to do in one service it's, it's, it's fine but if you want to do globally it's not fine right and often you know these libraries they are coupled to other libraries and they hide too many things for you so you know nowadays probably if you ask a lot of companies they will say no we don't have a corporate uh, framework but you do have a library for persistence, you know, you do have a library for caching, you do have a library for logging, you do have a library for accessing uh, Kafka or Kinesis. So there's libraries for everything, right? And this, this, these all libraries are coupled together and, you know, they are framework, uh, pretty much corporate frameworks dressed as libraries. Um, the other issue, right, that end up stealing microservices are tables. And tables, they became a, your contract. And I, I, I call them like contract by accident, right? So if you have a table and you expose, right? And there's several applications using that table. If you change one thing, you're going to break several applications. So you don't have freedom. You cannot change, right? You cannot upgrade anything under the hood. So you really want to hide all your tables, all your data stores, all your caches like Redis, like main cache D. And also I would say you want to hide your configurations. Because sometimes, you know, people end up doing this contract by accident. Um, and let's say you have a jar that uh, can do something for us, like logging. And then, you know, there is a file I put there where you use that file to configure um, our logging. So that file, it doesn't matter the format, if it's XML, if it's JSON, if it's YAML, that file is going to be part of your contract. So your contract will be much more than your REST interfaces or your Java objects. You end up being everything you expose, and that could be queues, it could be configuration, it could be um, tables. So basically, you don't want to do this contract by accident, and you need to hide these things. I think in general the industry still um, fails on that, but people are kind of start to getting this. Um, the issue pretty much is on the jar part that people didn't get at all. So, you know, th there are all these issues that we are killing microservices and how can we fix these things? How can we work in the way that we, you know, end up not killing our microservices? So I think there's a couple of things we can do. So first, we need to work on the basics. Um, we need to accept duplications. There are package uh, approaches we could use. Uh, we need to leverage isolations. There are some things we can put on platforms and also there is education. So let's let's get in details for each of those. So basically, when I say back to the basics, I'm talking about SOA. So microservice are a specific flavor of SOA. And you know, SOA was nice because it was about principles. And there are several interesting principles here, like that one there that says flexibility over optimization. I should never trade my flexibility for optimization because it will lead to coupling and to cost, right? Uh, you can look the previous principle when it says shared service over specific purpose implementations. So in SOA, you just have services. You want to share something, create a service. Um, you guys might know, you know, Jeff Bezos from Amazon in 2002 uh, wrote a mail letter saying that all the teams had to 
write uh, contracts and expose their data through REST interface and search interfaces. And uh, if they do the, they do not follow that, they would be fired pretty much. So that was the famous like SOA or, or get fired in May, right? That if you look on the internet, you're gonna see it. And basically that's the thing, right? That's the principle. You really need to hide your things. Otherwise you won't have a service, you won't have benefits. So we really need to need to go back to these principles. Uh, that's really key. Another thing is we need to stop accepting dependencies or jars from strangers, right? We need to protect um, our class path um, and strangers these actions are not strangers, are people that we know, right? That work on our companies. Um, we need to stop using shared libraries. You know, Netflix OSS, Spring Boot are fine. You can use these or you can use anything you want as long as it's inside of the service that is hidden by a contract. And, you know, you don't want to make this global, like everybody needs to use, um, you know, Netflix or SaaS or Spring Boot in all services. That's a very bad deal. Um, but easily someone can say, but Diego, I want the same capability. There are several services that want the same thing. Let's reuse. I would say that's a bad idea. You know, that end up being like famous uh, last words. Packages can help you here as well because packages can provide isolations. There are plenty of tools that can do fat jars and they can use techniques like package explosion. So basically, um, let's say you depend on common slang and then you could import that common slang package in your jar and rename that package. In that way, you wouldn't have um, coupling. But of course, this, this will create a problem. The memory will increase, you will use more memory. But again, this will be better than shared libraries. And other times, and people don't do this, I think, enough, um, you know, you could, instead of pulling up hundreds of dependencies because you want to use one method, why don't you go there, copy that code and put that code in your library, right? Sometimes it's much easier to just copy the code. And that that's the same for services. We want to isolate everything. Isolation is key here. So we don't want to have contract by accident. So we want to isolate all our data stores, all our caches, all our configs, all our implementation. And based on that, we can do backward and forward compatibility only on the contract level. We don't need to do on the data level. Platforms can help us and platforms can be manifested in several different ways, right? So one way that a platform might manifest in sense of tooling, another um, comparison you could think about is like Spring Framework old days, before Spring Boot. When Spring Framework was created, all right, there was no imports in your class path. You had your configurations on XML and your code was pure. There was no binary coupling whatsoever, right? And in that sense, um, that's a, a good platform, right? Companies also can do self-service automated services. So let's say I have a service that provide a database backup for me. And you know, that's not a jar on my class path and, and that's good. Another option might be sidecars like Envoy, for instance. On Netflix OSS uh, stack, they had other sidecars um, like Prana, for instance. And, and basically the idea of the sidecar is like you have a whole process, you have two PIDs run side by side, and you know you can add your common logic or the feature you need to several services to use inside that sidecar, and that's what uh, Envoy does. And Istio uses Envoy, and with Envoy, you have um, load balancing, you have halting, and you have um, observability, you have metrics. And the good thing about it is, being a side process, a sidecar, it means there is zero dependencies on your class path. And that's the beauty of the thing. There is no binary coupling there, all right? And finally, we can go to runtime platforms like Kubernetes. And I want to say a couple of specific things here. So that's not new. If we look at before, even on SOA, it was going towards like platforms. Several folks was going towards heavy, you know, ESPs. And, you know, th there was this rest and, uh, uh, you know, uh, guerrilla movement saying, you know, let's, we, we are putting too many things on ESBs. We don't need it. Let's put all inside of the services. And then we end up with these distributed monoliths by all these reasons I said before. So if you go to Kubernetes and you have solutions at the platform level, that might be a solution. But I, I need to give a warning here, right? That might be a problem as well as we go Kubernetes, all the things 
if you want to run stateful, if you want to run on the edge, if you want to run all workloads there and all the common code now go in, in the platform like Istio is doing, um, there is a chance that will be the same issue, right? But in a different form. So we need to balance things, right? There's no one size fits all. And finally, we really need to work towards education. Education is really, really important. So, you know, we need to understand and live by SOA principles. Uh, we need to have training on our companies. And, and finally, I would say we need to accept the trade-offs. We need to accept that with microservices, we will have duplication and that's fine. And that's a continuous effort. It's something like. So that's what I got for today. I hope you guys like it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Diego. Um, I was just looking at the chat. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, ah, I forgot I put, I didn't put my, No, there is a, does anyone have any question? Well, I'll ask one. <laughs> um, actually, uh, from the, uh, the last point you mentioned uh, around education, uh, especially um, um, at the university level, you know, do you think the universities, uh, at least from your uh, experience, um, um, kind of uh, the current curriculum uh, kind of, uh, um, are kind of um, uh, educating the young, the, 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 the students to be ready to jump off to the modern trends that the industry are uh, currently uh, um, kind of uh, using at the moment? I think that's an interesting question. Um, in, in the way I see it, um, lots of young folks get frustrated with uh, education um, on university, right? Because um, they they want to actually be ready for um, you know to the to the market and to the industry and clearly when when you look to the university curriculum uh, you you never have like exactly the same things the same language the same frameworks and it's very hard to keep up especially like with JavaScript where you have a framework every day right so it's it's really hard and I think the problem is um, I think there's two things right so one thing is uh, I think there's a big difference between learning and education. And, and basically, you know, you want to do uh, the university because you want to get some skills. You know, you want to you know, learn how to research. You want to learn how to think. And not necessarily that will help you with your day-by-day -day problems right now. But definitely on the future, uh, you know, have these scientist skills will definitely pay off. Um, I think there's some um, middle ground we can achieve. But I also would say, you know, if you just learn the things that you needed right now by your job, I don't think on, on a long run that, you know, will, will, will pay off at all. Um, I think there's another problem that happens, especially in, in Brazil, which is, you know, in, in US, at least what you see is like the folks that are on the university, they're really glued together with the companies. So they're working on real problems, you know, they're really partnerships between um, companies and university in the US, uh, you basically, you know, when you want to hire someone, you say um, either you are, uh, you have a master degree or, you know, you have like, I don't know, six, eight years of experience. Like in Brazil, it's like, I don't care about your degree. I just want to, you know, six years of experience. And I think um, that plays a very important role um, and makes, uh, it makes more sense. I think uh, th that's a thing that definitely needs to be fixed worldwide. <laughs> No, absolutely. I uh, completely agree. Uh, thank you. Someone posted a, a question on the chat. Um, if not microservices, you mean back to monolithic uh, architecture? Uh, how to overcome issues which comes in monolith uh, architecture? Yeah, that's a good question. So basically, I'm not saying let's go back to a monolith, but what I'm saying is um, we need to get real right we don't have microservices out there at all right we just are naming it microservice we don't have isolation we don't have the ability to change code in place right and if we don't have that right we either have two options either we go back to monolith because then we're definitely going to have less problems 
right? Will be easier to maintain, easier to understand. Um, or we do this properly. If we want to do this properly, we need to start worrying about isolation. We need to hide our data stores, you know, hide our configurations. We need to pay attention to shared libraries. We need to, to understand that, you know, if I have a database and, you know, for, for the application, talk to database has a specific driver, it's fine. But if for a service, talk to a service, I need specific drive, that's a probably a bad deal, right? And, and the thing that we need to internalize is either we accept we are not doing microservice and let's go back to monolith and our life will be easier or you know let's duplicate code let's duplicate data and do this properly right so so i think that's are the things if we go to platforms um that opens a little bit more in sense of options because now you don't need to have binary coupling because again you know as engineers we always like to reuse right we don't like to duplicate that's kind of a, on our bones right and, and with platform, you can do that because, you know, you don't have binary coupling, but we need to be careful with that. We did that before with ESBs, we paid a high price, and I'm really afraid that we do this with Istio now, you know, and, and became the same thing. So it's the story repeats over and over again. Okay, that's right. Um, is, there, is there any other question? There's none, but I'll follow up with another one. Uh, this is with another trendy uh, paradigm uh, which is the serverless. How do you see uh, serverless and uh, microservices? Uh, can uh, serverless uh, supplement microservices? How do it uh, uh, implement it properly or the other way around? Yeah, I think there's um, a lot of interesting things on that discussion. Um, if, you, if you look like serverless, um, there are some papers I can send you guys later on, but basically in some sense, it looks like we are doing some steps forward, but we are doing several steps backward, right? Because the step forwards are, you know, we have runtime abstraction. We don't really need to worry about infrastructure, which is good because like I was saying before, microservices, you know, impose a huge infrastructure effort and you really need to have DevOps, you need, need to have provisioning. So there is a cost um, to it. With serverless, we don't have this cost. We don't need to worry uh, too much about servers, right? And that's a good thing. However, you lose all the basic um, principles of distributed computing, right? In distributed computing, you want to have the code and the data, right? And you want to move the code close to the data, not the other way around. You don't want to move the data to the code because that's expensive, right? So let's say you have a database with 10 billion records. You don't want to get all the database, go to the network, move to the JVM, do something and send it back. As we know, that's really, you know, distributed systems 101. And I need to say that because serverless is doing exactly that, right? Because, you know, they're not run on your data, they run outside, right? So that's this problem. That's problems of cold bootstrap, right? Because as you have this nature of, you need to build up, run, um, boot up a machine, run something in tier now. Amazon has some cache, it's, you know, things that help you there. But, you know, the nature of the thing is really uh, event driven and some problems are not event driven. All right. So there is a cost. Um, you cannot do like uh, latest sensitive computation there. Right. Because of that. And also, you know, you lose all the all the premises of, um, you know, distributed systems 101, not only because of the data and the code thing I mentioned, but also because, um, you know, you don't have an IP on a serverless, right? You cannot address it. So you really lose several, you know, uh, techniques that we are used to do and you don't have it there. So that's kind of a step backward uh, on serverless. Um, the second thing is serverless, we might be facing this problem of distributed monolith and it might be thousands of times worse, right? Because you have a runtime abstraction, but, um, you know, in, inside of your serverless code, there's so few many things you can do. You basically only do two things, right? Either you have a jar there, so you have more code to help you, or you're going to do a remote call. So you are, uh, some people say that serverless is a good way to be coupled with the cloud because you end up using all the services that the cloud provide, right? And, and I think that's true. Um, you will end up doing way more distributing, more, more distribution, more remote calls, and you're using more jars because, you know, that's the options what, what you have. So, 
you know, this um, this problem that I'm pointing out, like, you know, we need to accept duplication, we need to mind things, right? In, in, in the sense, it is, you know, for, for surplus is the same. So we should be creating services rather than shipping jars, especially because there's a limit and it's not that big of how many jars you can put on a service, right? And, and, and that's something important. Thank you. Uh, let me check. There's another question on the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says the distributed uh, monolith is a real problem. Any good resources you might suggest for correct way of implementing microservice uh, building? Yes, um, you know, in, in my um, slide deck, that probably going to be available after the, the, the call, um, th there's a couple of links. Uh, there is one very interesting Netflix uh, presentation where they they tell the story how they build a distributed monolith and i think you know like in, in technology we need to be archaeologists sometimes you know we need to learn the story so we don't make the same mistakes and the reason i'm pointing this out is because you know like uh five years ago pretty much like netflix OSS was the thing around java if you're, if you're doing java netflix OSS was the thing and a couple of years later you spring uh, end up, you know, pretty much creating abstractions around Netflix OSS, and and right now is the thing. If you talk about Java, probably folks are doing Spring, right? And I, I want to point that out because, you know, Spring Cloud uses Netflix OSS, and and you know, and, and Spring was saying, hey guys, we end up building a distributed monolith because of this shared library here, um, and and I use a lot of that stack, so I saw it. And now we are going Spring and say, no, it's not Rx Java, it's Mono and Flux, it's different things. It's not, it's the same deal, right? So we, we might end up uh, on a bad place as well. As, as well. So um, on the slides, uh, there's a blog post. Um, I, I, I'm going to send the links and there's other links. Uh, also, uh, there's a very popular uh, Kubernetes uh, evangelist, um, uh, Kelsey Hightower. And he also said that, uh, you know, People are gonna kill Kubernetes because they're throwing so many things there. So yeah, that there are resources I can share <laughs> on that. Cool, fantastic. Uh, I just want to say, uh, emphasize. I will um, uh, at the end. I will follow up in an email and uh, share all the resources that references that uh, Diego has to to share. So yeah, uh, there's another question. Um, uh, are there uh, any rule of thumb to divide your domain to keep your microservice in a manageable production size? That's a very good question. Um, so, so I believe there's two things, all right? One thing is uh, capability, and the second thing is modeling. Um, I, I want to say that you want the capability um, besides the modeling, all right? And what I mean by that is, um, you want to have some things in place, right? As you have a service interface, you have a contract. If, you, if your consumers just see that contract and that can be manifested as a REST call, JSON, or you know, binary, gRPC, or whatever, but you have a contract. If that's the only thing you see it, under the hood, you can do whatever you want. You can use any language, you know, any version of Spring, you can downgrade, you can change it, you can remodel it, and it's good. The problem is two things. One, what if you get that boundary wrong, right? You make something too small or too big, right? That's the first problem. And, and for that problem, that's a very hard question to answer, all right? Because, you know, in the beginning of a project or in Denver, you might not know the domain very well, right? So several folks recommend, you know, do not start with microservices. I, I can say, you know, you definitely want to do SOA. In SOA, the main difference was, you know, SOA was not never prescripting the granularity. SOA never said there is a small or big or medium sized service, right? So, and I think that's the key thing. Sometimes we are having these modeling issues because we are making things too small, right? And, and microservice, as the name implies, it needs to be micro, right? It needs to be small. So I think sometimes it makes sense glue concepts together. It will reduce complexity, we reduce network countries and several things. So I would say start a kind of bit more fat in all services. And as you go, if you think it makes sense to split it, you can split. The other way around is much harder because um, here goes another unpopular opinion, right? Duplicated and monolith code is decoupled. If you have a monolith, it's very easy 
not so easy, but it's much easier than when you have distribution. As you have a service that has 200 applications using that service, will be very hard to refactor that contract. So, so the distribution, if you get it wrong, will be really painful, right? And, and that's one thing. And, and, and the other thing I want to say is, is in the sense of the capability is, um, you know, like if you have CQ URS, right? You have event sourcing. Having a queue and putting your data there, it provides you abstraction. Even if you are modeling completely wrong, and I'm not saying you should model it wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't worry about modeling, right? But let's say you're getting a table, you are putting exactly that table on the message for, for Kafka or Kinesis, right? One by one. Um, you know, just because you have that queue on, on Kinesis or Kafka, your uh, other services are not coupled with your real table. You know, they're coupled with that data, which means you can change your table, right? And, and, and that's the capability. You want that level of interaction, right? Of course, you want the modeling as well. But I would say uh, if you get the interaction there, you know, you, you can worry about the model uh, later on and improve, right? And that's why if you start a bit bigger, it will be easier to reduce rather than it start super small, you know, it better be bright or the effect will be super high. Fantastic. Thank you. Is there any other question? I have one related to engineering culture, since you mentioned Netflix, because um, every once in a while I come across a uh, um, uh, VP of engineering or, you know, or CTO of a startup and these things uh, wanting to import a kind of uh, engineering culture from, say, Netflix, for instance, you know, because they use uh, microservices, they use chaos monkeys and, the, and these type of uh, tools and these things. Uh, can culture really be uh, imported? You know, if not, what do you need to import engineering culture? Is it that simple to say, hey, I want to do engineering like uh, like uh, like Netflix does? That's a really great question. Uh, I think the answer is no. Um, if it was the case, all right, we would see like 10 Netflix is out there, right? And we don't see it. And, you know, um, going back to the basics, all right, in Lean, there's one guy called Edward Deming. And he was saying, you know, back on the old days of Toyota versus Ford, like on the 80s, he was saying, stop trying to copy Toyota, right? Because right now everybody wants to copy Netflix or Spotify, right? I'm sure if it's Agile, it's Spotify they're copying, right? And then um, on, on the 80s, all right, there, there was copying Toyota. Toyota was like the, the Netflix of the time, right? And then he was saying, do not do that. Because when you copy, you copy the result. You are not copying the principles behind it. You are not copying the process that, you know, made that result. You are copying just what you've seen. So you're copying wrong. And I also would argue that you don't have the same problem. You know, in a startup, I think in the beginning, you want to validate your business model. You want to get customers. And to do that, you really need to have, like, poor decisions. You should not be worried to have a perfect architecture because that will... That will be your biggest advantage. And, 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 and if you see like a big company, right? What, what's the bigger issue in a big company has? Speed. They don't have speed. It's like a huge Titanic boat that takes so long to turn, you know? And, and I start up, what's the main advantage? You can do things fast. But let's dip into that. Why you can do things fast or how? Because you don't have a structure to maintain. So if you're on the beginning, you want to put structure, you are killing your, your most precious benefit, which is speed, all right? You don't want to lose that speed. So it sounds crazy what I'm saying, all right? But you want to do a poor architecture in the beginning, right? You want to have poor decisions, or some of those, right? Um, that make you go faster. And as you get bigger, and then you're going to have these problems, you know, you, you can do that. But I would say copy things without understanding the principles behind it is definitely a bad deal. Yeah, this is very interesting because... Uh... On the other end, um, these big uh, companies, the ones already adopting uh, um, microservices arch architecture, one of the things benefits they say is the speed to production because they are able to ship, 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 ship to, to production. So it gives that impression to the to startups like uh, you are saying that you know the wrong impression of the speed of the big companies by adopting the the the, uh, the, the architecture. Which is wrong because they don't have the infra, the, uh, the thing, all the stuff, the support that these other companies, these larger companies that uh, are uh, implement, have uh, successfully implemented these uh, successful in, uh, in 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 codes, huh? uh, the, the, the the architecture. 
I think one issue on there is because folks just look like, um, you know, what's going right now. It's like a snapshot, right? It's the same issue with the Spotify paper, right? So basically, if you look Netflix right now, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to copy exactly like this. But let's go back and remember, Netflix was a 90s company, right? It was not born uh, now, right? And if you go back 10 years ago, they didn't have microservices. You know what they had? They had a monolith using Java and Oracle. Whoa, hold on a second. That's what my company had. That's what everybody had, right? Exactly, right? So so, so they evolved to that as they need, right? And as they became a problem. And again, I would say, yeah, uh, you want to have thousands of services, but then again, you are a startup, right? That means you have thousands of products or you are tackling thousands of markets. That's a bad deal for you, right? You want to get one thing right before you expand. If you look Uber right now, you say, okay, but Uber is doing food, is doing, you know, high sharing, probably, you know, going to do whatever, a bunch of stuff. But they are in a point now that you are not, all right? You cannot start with the same offers. So I would argue that's a bad deal as well. And, you know, that's a mistake. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's see if we have another question. Okay, we don't have any question. Uh, I have a final one for you. It's uh, more of a uh, your crystal ball. <laughs> how do you see what? Um, how do you think uh, five years will look uh, from now on, uh, from 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 the moment in terms of uh, all these things, distributed systems, um, microservices in particular, in industry? What trends? I believe, you? Yeah, I believe. Um... We're going to repeat the story and, uh, you know, all the things will be running in Kubernetes and, and Istio, right? There's a huge, because, you know, the problem is we, we cannot balance things. We don't know how to put things in two boxes. We need to put all our stuff in one thing, right? And that's that's the problem. We're always looking for one size fits all, right? And that never changes and keeps happening. And, and I believe that's what will happen because... If you think it through, how can we massively migrate everything we have without changing anything, right? That's what everybody's looking, right? Eating the cake and having the cake. And I think um, what's more close to that probably will be Kubernetes and Istio, right? Because you don't need to change your application code, all right? Or just delete it. You don't need to modify it uh, pretty much. So I, I think the biggest risk uh, is happening is like we move all the things to the platform. And I think that's the movement that's more close to happen, right? right now okay thank you does anyone have any other question uh, there's no question do you have any final comment you would like uh, to, to to make on this uh, Diego before we wrap up yeah I would say you know if, if you want to do things right you know get 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 the basics right get solid you know distributed system you know background and principles um, you know you start things in a way that, you know, even if they are dumber, they're not like the fastest way possible. You know, you need to be able to master the things. As you keep changing technology, like every two years, you're never going to master it if you are keep changing it, right? You need to have time to do things to evolve. And I would say stick to the principles. Um, and, you know, SOA can help you a lot. Um, if you have issues with that, you know, start with a monolith or start with a bigger service and try to accept duplication. It's not bad at all in the end of the day. And I think that's, you know, a better path. Cool. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there, is, there are no more uh, questions. Uh, this webinar will be available on YouTube. Uh, we'll follow up on an email to let you know once it's uh, being uploaded. Uh, likewise, all the resources, any extra resources Diego uh, shares with us, we'll uh, share it with you. So have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Diego. Thank you. Okay, guys. Bye. Okay.